everyone. I think we're about ready to get started. I want to thank you all for coming out today. I know it's a little rainy and gross outside, but I appreciate you coming out for the Wetterhahn Symposium. Uh, it's a really fun event, and it's really good to see everybody out. Um, so just a couple of notes before we get started. Um, students, if you are in the back, uh, please don't um, uh, organize your posters until after the um, keynote address and the student award ceremony. Um, there'll be plenty of time before the student uh, poster session starts at 5.30 to do that. So just be aware. Um, we can hear everything. <laughs> um, Okay, so uh, I know you're all really excited to hear the keynote address from our new president, um, but I am too. Before that though, I wanted to um, bring someone up who can speak a little bit about the woman for whom this event is named, Karen E. Wetterhahn. Um, she was Karen's colleague and friend, and uh, she's also the Associate Dean of the Sciences and the Alfred Smith Professor of Chemistry. So um, I'd love to bring up Professor Jane Smith. Jane Lipson, sorry. Jane Lipson, Smith Professor. <laughs> Thank you. I've never noticed that I am the Albert W. Smith Professor, and of course, I'm happy to work with my colleague Elizabeth Smith, who's the Dean of Faculty. I never noticed that confluence before, so interesting. Well, it's my honor to say a few words about my late colleague, Karen Wetterhahn. Karen was the first woman to be hired in, in the tenure stream in the chemistry department at Dartmouth. She was hired in 1976. I was the second woman to be hired in the chemistry as a, ten, a tenure stream chemistry professor. So she was certainly there and well established by the time I arrived. So she already was a full professor by that point. Karen filled numerous roles at the institution. She was the Dean of Graduate Studies. She was the Associate Dean of Faculty for the Sciences, a role I am now serving in. And in 1995, she served briefly as uh, the, the Dean of Faculty, in fact. But today, I wanted to focus on science and community. In 1990, along with Carol Miller, Karen Wetterhahn co-founded the Women in Science program, which is, of course, still vibrant today, and a model program for others in the country. In uh, 1995, she developed the Superfund program grant. And here, I want to quote something that Karen said. And I got this quote from a eulogy that was um, linked in a wonderful CNE News article that was published last year about Karen Wetterhahn. And there is a link to that article on the Women in Science program website, Dartmouth's website. So you can trail it there, and I, I recommend it. She said about the, uh, about the uh, Superfund program grant, I like it as a model for how we can bring together people from different departments and schools so many of the large, complex problems we face must be solved by the interdisciplinary approach. That was in 1995, she was talking about that. Scientifically, Karen was probably best known for the uptake reduction model of chromium toxicity. So this is a model where cells take in chromium-6, which is not inherently toxic itself, but then it gets reduced to chromium-3, producing along the way reactive intermediates, including oxygen radicals, which are themselves toxic. Karen was a superb scientist and a talented creator of community in the service of science, as both WISP and the Superfund efforts clearly demonstrate. Our late president, former president, Jim Wright, who drew Karen into service in Wentworth, certainly appreciated her talents as both a scientist and an organizer. He remarked that she would have been a great university president. Would have been because, as you all know, Karen died in 1997 after accidental exposure to dimethylmercury. I have numerous memories of Karen, but the clearest one I have is seeing how excited she was in diving back into the research she dearly loved after leaving Wentworth. A passion for science and a determination that women be equal partners in the world of scientific endeavors. These traits are marvelously represented throughout this room. And they are especially embodied in the next two speakers. 
scientist, soon to be colleague, and our next president, Sian Bylock, and my colleague, accomplished scientist and dean of the faculty, Elizabeth Smith. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm so excited to be here with you today. We're here today to celebrate the accomplishments of our undergraduate researchers in the sciences. Their hands-on discoveries and collaborations with faculty are at the heart of a Dartmouth education. This afternoon, I have the great privilege of introducing our keynote speaker, President-elect Sian Leah Bylock. But before I formally introduce Sian, I can't help but take a moment to recognize that on June 12th this year, we will have an Associate Dean for the Sciences, a Dean of the Faculty of the Arts and Sciences, a Dean of the Thayer School of Engineering, and a President who are all women scientists. I think Karen would be pleased. So like Karen Wetterhahn, Sian has earned an international reputation as a leading scientist and as a role model for women in the sciences. A cognitive scientist, she is one of the world's leading experts on the brain science behind choking under pressure and the brain and body factors influencing performance anxiety. In her research, writing, and public speaking, she offers evidence-based strategies that can be used to perform well under pressure in all contexts, from test taking to golf. Sian has authored over 100 peer-reviewed publications as well as two critically acclaimed books, Choke, What the Secrets of the Brain Reveal About Getting It Right When You Have To, and How the Body Knows Its Mind, The Surprising Power of the Physical Environment to Influence How You Think and Feel. If you haven't seen it already, I encourage you to watch her 2017 TED Talk, which has been viewed over two and a half million times. Sian has been chosen as one of the 25 women to watch by Crane's Chicago Business Magazine and received early career contribution awards from the Psychonomics Society, the Society of Experimental Psychologists, the American Psychological Foundation, and the Association for Psychological Science. In 2017, she received the National Academy of Sciences Trolland Research Award for her pioneering work on anxiety and performance in high stress situations. Sian is a member of the National Academy of Kinesiology and the Council on Foreign Relations and a fellow of both the American Psychological Association and the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Her research has been funded by the U.S. Department of Education, the National Science Foundation, and a number of private foundations. As Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, I'm especially thrilled that Sian will join our community not only as our president, but as a member of the Department of Psychological and Brain Sciences. The title of her talk today is Academic Performance Under Stress. Please join me in welcoming this pioneering scientist and Dartmouth's 19th president, Sian Bylock. Well, thank you both, and it's really wonderful to be here today. Um, when I heard about the symposium and the person it was honoring and the fact that we would be celebrating and getting to see so many of the important undergraduate research projects that had been done, um, I just had to say yes. And I'm coming up for a quick trip, and then I'm going back um, to finish up my presidency at Barnard, and I will be back officially on June 12th, so pretty soon. Um, Another reason I said I, I was so excited to be given this opportunity is because it was actually at a talk like this where I decided I was going to major in cognitive science. I was an undergrad at the University of California, San Diego, and I had had maybe 10 different majors my first year, not at the same time. It wasn't impressive. I just kept on going back and forth. And I heard a talk by a scientist, Elizabeth Blackburn, who then went on to win a Nobel Prize. And she talked about how a lot of her career had been failure. And I was immediately intrigued 
history by the fact that you could have a career as, by, being, by failing at things. And it was when I really fell in love with the scientific process, that you put hypotheses out there, that often those hypotheses are wrong, that you iterate, you get data, you understand that data, and you do it again. And so um, it's exciting to see all of you and the posters around the room, and to know that whether or not you go on to get a PhD in science, or go to med school, or go on to work in business, or some other field, you bring that scientific perspective to everything you do. So today, I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about what my research team and I have discovered about how the mind works. And when we talk about the mind, we mean just what the brain, the physical brain does. Um, and I'm especially interested not just in how the mind works and how it helps support us to get good at what we do. I've spent a career actually studying why we sometimes fail to do things that we might otherwise have the skills to do. Um, and I do this because I think not enough research is focused on failure. It's often focused on how we get good, and also because it's complete me-search for me. I think oftentimes I was told growing up that I should, if, as a scientist, has to be completely objective and, and not passionate about what they do, and I kind of think that's bullshit. It's great to be passionate about what you do, and I've always wanted to understand why I sometimes succeed in stressful situations and why I sometimes failed. So basically, um, my research group and I have, have made a project of doing that. Um, and we do this in lots of different ways. So um, we essentially use converging evidence. We do work in the laboratory, where we actually bring people in and put them in stressful situations. We use functional neuroimaging to try and understand what happens in the brain. And we also do work in the classroom or in other performance environments from the golf course to the boardroom. Today I'm going to talk to you specifically about a line of work that we've focus, focused on in the last several years that um, unfortunately, and we can have a whole other talk about this, for many, especially in the US, induces fear without even doing anything. And that's math. Now you don't hear really intelligent people walking around bragging about not being reading people, but you often hear highly accomplished people bragging about not being math. People. And in the US and in Western cultures especially, it's socially acceptable to do that. And we know that people often have a lot of anxiety about this subject. Now it's an entirely other talk where it comes from, and I can tell you about that. But for the purposes of today, it's really interesting because we can use math as really a gateway into understanding what happens in stressful situations, why people who might otherwise have the ability to perform poorly. And if we can understand that, then we can start asking questions about what do we do to help people in the most pressure filled situations. So the question really that we're going to try and answer today is what actually happens in pressure filled situations? What happens in the brain and body that leads to less than optimal performance? And how can we use that knowledge to try and help people perform better? Now oftentimes, and I'm sure faculty have experienced this, maybe students have experienced this, you study really hard, you go into a test, and then you didn't do so well. And you walk out and you say, I choked, I performed worse than expected. Now that may in fact be true, but it's also often the case that people who are anxious about a subject, it's not just that they perform poorly in the moment, they actually perform poorly in terms of how they prepare for what's going on. And we know that because people don't actually like to do things that they feel uncomfortable about. And my research team and I have been really interested in this with respect to math. We know that people who have math anxiety go to great lengths to avoid doing math, whether it's calculating a tip on a dinner bill or what math classes they take. We actually know that elementary school teachers who have one of the highest levels of math anxiety of any college major often pick universities for education programs where there are less math requirements. And so we've been really interested in this idea and this hypothesis that maybe part of the reason that people who are anxious about math perform poorly in it isn't necessarily all due to their ability, but that they avoid getting ready for math in the right way. And so the question is, could we do an experiment where we equated people on their ability and showed that people who were really worried about math, and it's easy to get that, you just ask someone, how worried are you about math? It's a pretty reliable measure. Maybe they avoid doing hard math and do it specifically for math. This isn't about all subjects. It's about something they're anxious about. So we did this across a number of different experiments. These we did online, where we actually invited people to be part of an experiment, and we asked them to do math problems and word problems. We told them that they were gonna be easy or hard. We made it easy and hard for their ability. So everyone was equated for ability. So if you're really good at math, the pro hard problem was, was harder for you than if you weren't as good at math. And then we essentially offered them money 
to do easy and hard problems. So in this particular study, you got two bucks if you chose an easy math problem, or you'd get five dollars if you chose a hard math problem. We did the same thing for, for word problems, and you can see examples of the kinds of problems on the right. So for the math problem, the easy one you're solving for the blue square, four times two equals eight, although that's not how my 12-year-old was taught to do math, so maybe that's a bad one to use. Um, and then you can see the one all the way on the right is much, um, it's much more difficult. And then for the word problem, um, again, we really tested these to make sure it took the same amount of time as the math problem, and you can see the easier one on the, on the right, on the left plan versus the harder one on the left. And so what we were really interested in is how people approach these problems. Would they actually take the easier way out, even if we were offering them markedly more money to do something that was harder? But most specifically, would this be dependent on the level of anxiety they had about math? So we recruited people based on their math anxiety, and we had them do both math and word problems. And again, what we've done here is we've level set how the effort that people are putting into these problems. Maybe someone who's better at math would be doing a level seven as their hard problem. Maybe someone who's not as well versed in math, a hard problem would be level five or something else. What we found is that specific for math, the more math anxiety you reported to have, the less likely you were to choose the hard math, even when we were offering you more money to do it. But this wasn't the case for the ward problem. So it wasn't just that people, some people don't want to do difficult stuff. It was specific to the anxiety they had about this subject. And here's the data. This is our study one. And what you can see on the left here on the y-axis is the hard choice. So the percent of time they would choose the hard math problem and the word problem. And what you see on the, the x-axis is how much math things they had. Five is a lot of math. You really are worried about math. One, you're not so worried about math. And what you can see is that the more math anxiety you have, the less likely you are to choose the hard math problem, even though we're throwing more money at you. But that's not true for the word problem. So it's really not that people who are just avoiding anything. And so we thought, OK, this is great data. Um, can we do it again? We did it again. Same sort of uh, finding with a much bigger population of, of people. Each open, square, open circle is a person. The more math anxiety you have, the less likely you are to choose to do this difficult math, even when we're paying you to do it. OK, now you're going to say, well, maybe no one really cares about two versus five dollars. Maybe this is just online. It doesn't matter. So the next question we had is, well, does this actually play out in how students who are motivated to do well in, say, a math class study and get ready for a math exam? So my postdoc at, currently, who's going off um, to, to take a job at Columbia, um, asked this question. She went into AP calculus classes in high schools and actually and asked people at the beginning, students at the beginning of the class, how math anxious are you? And then she recorded how they studied throughout the, the semester to get ready for the AP calculus BC exam, which I'm guessing some of you in this room took. The first thing she wanted to do know was what makes studying or something, studying something difficult. And what she did is she had students rate the kinds of studying they could do. So you can actually do practice problems. That's rated as the most difficult kind of studying. Or you could read the book or just read through things. So regardless of people's math anxiety, students rated doing the practice problems as the most difficult, the most effortful. But then she looked at, as a function of students' math anxieties, what they actually studied throughout the semester and how it related to their AP math exam. So she was able to go back, get permission to actually look at the score on their exam. And then her question was, does math anxiety predict your AP math exam score? And can you account for that relationship by how people studied, got ready for the exam? Again, with this idea that, we don't like doing things that make us uncomfortable, and maybe students who are more math anxious actually are more likely to study in poorer ways. They might spend the same amount of time, but maybe they're just reading the book instead of doing the difficult practice problems, what's actually harder and allows us to learn. So let me show you what she found. So on the y-axis here is the proportion of time allocated to different study strategies. There's a lot of different studies, reading the textbook, rereading the textbook, reading examples of problems, reviewing your notes, and solving practice problems. 
On the left here are low math anxious students getting ready for the AP calculus test, and on the right are high math anxious students. And what the really important point that she found here is that the students who are high in math anxiety spent a considerably less time doing the hard practice problems as they were getting ready for this exam. They actually spent less time doing the difficult thing. And if you look at the relationship between math anxiety and exam performance, it's exactly what you see. High math anxious individuals perform more poorly on the exam, and it was mediated or partially accounted for by the amount of time they spent doing practice problems and the number of problems that they did. People who are higher in math anxiety, even in AP calculus, are avoiding doing the difficult thing that makes you anxious, and as a result, performing less well on the AP calculus exam. Again, going back to this idea that part of performance anxiety and its relationship to how you do could be related to what's actually happening during the stressful situation, but it's also in terms, we've, we've argued in terms of how you prepare and get ready for an exam. Okay, so it's not just that being, not getting ready and doing the practice problems is the only reason we would argue that people do perf perform poorly in situations that they're anxious about. It's also true that things happen in the brain and body in the anxious situation that can lead to poor performance. And we've also looked at that as well. So it turns out that what happens in pressure-filled situations, well, first is we avoid what makes us uncomfortable to get ready, but we also know that we have negative emotional reactions that can change how the brain functions. And we've been really interested in this because we think if we can understand what happens, then perhaps we can devise strategies to help people perform better. So in the particular study I'm gonna to talk to you about, we use a technique called functional MRI, which I think a lot of people in this room use. Um, an MRI machine is just a big magnet, that's all it is. It measures the magnetic properties of whatever's inside it. It's often 50 to 100,000 times stronger than the Earth's magnetic field. In this case, we're interested in the magnetic properties of what's going on in the head. We know brain tissue has different magnetic properties, so you can get a picture using an MRI of what the brain structure looks like. But with a slight tweak in MRI called the functional MRI, you can also use it to infer brain function. And the reason you can do this is because when neurons, brain cells, are firing, they need things. They need nutrients. They need oxygen. They need glucose. And the way those nutrients get to the neurons is through the blood. And when the blood is carrying those nutrients, it has different magnetic properties than when it's not. And you can actually use that to infer which areas of the brain are asking for the most nutrients and which areas of the brain are working the hardest. And so we've invited people to our lab who are either not anxious about math at all or really anxious, and we don't tell them we're doing math before we invite them to the lab or they might not come. And they get there and we say, surprise, we're gonna put you in the scanner and we're gonna have you do some math. No one runs away. Um, at some point I'll tell you a study about how, a story in the future about how once I did a, a a study with professional hockey players in the scanner, and it was so exciting to be able to get professional hockey players to come, and a couple were too big to fit. <laughs> but no one who was, who was in our math study had that problem. <laughs> so they were in the scanner, and basically what we were interested in is what was going on in, in the head, what was happening in the brain, when not just when they were doing math, but when we just told them that they were about to do math. Again, really nice with MRI is that you can actually separate a reaction to just this knowledge that you're gonna to have to do something from the actual act of doing it. And that's really important because we're always working against this idea that being anxious about something is just a result of being bad at it. Which, of course, there's a relationship, but we actually think the anxiety in itself can change how people study and affect how much they know, but also can change how they allocate attention and their, their memory in the moment to affect how well they perform. So in one study, we had people lying in the scanner and they saw a square, either a blue square or a yellow square. We were 100% honest with them. When they saw a blue square, they were gonna have to solve a word problem. When they saw a yellow square, they were gonna have to solve a math problem. The goal here was to tell us whether it was true or false. Is valid, is the math problem true or false? What about the word? The goal of the word here is if the letters are reversed, does it spell a real word? 
very close, right? This is a psychologist's idea of a joke. It almost gets to experiment, but not really. And so we had people who were less anxious about math, more anxious about math. We invited them into the scanner, and what we do, they're lying there, they had a computer screen in front of them, a little button box next to them, and we'd flash a square, a blue or a yellow. Then we were really interested in what was happening in the brain when they just knew the math or word problem were coming. Now again, they haven't done any math, so if we start seeing differences in what's happening in the brain when they just know the math is coming, then that tells us something about how a negative emotional reaction is separable from actually performing well or bad at math. And in several studies, we've been able to show that just knowing that something you're anxious about, in this case math, was coming, leads to changes in the brain, which then impact how you actually perform on the math task. And here's just an example of one study. If this is my brain, you've taken off the left hemisphere and you're looking in at the mid-cingulate cortex. And at the bottom, you're the doctor standing behind me. You've sliced off the top of my head and you're looking at bilaterally at an area called the posterior insula. And what we showed was that for people who were really anxious about math, when they just knew the math was coming relative to the word problem, these areas of the brains were more likely to be active relative to people who were less anxious. And these areas of the brain are really interesting because they're are often involved in our neural pain matrix, like if we prick our finger with a needle or stub our toe and people say math is painful, some of our research has shown, well, maybe there's actually some truth to that. People are actually in some sort of neural pain here. And what we've shown is that when people are really anxious about doing math and they know the math is coming and these neural pain matrix are activated, it then leads to lower performance when they're actually doing the math. So again, this idea that under pressure, not only do we not study or get prepared well for the stressful situation, but in the stressful situation when we know it's coming, how we're reacting changes and it affects our ability to attend and perform our best. Okay. What do we do with this information? I've just told you that I, people who are really anxious about math don't prepare in the way that they should even though they might not know it. And people who are really anxious about a situation actually have these negative emotional reactions as they're going into the situation that changes how their brain functions. As I said at the beginning, my whole goal of my research is to use this knowledge to understand how we can help people perform better. So one place that this research actually intersects with a lot of the work I do in as my role as a president is to think about how we get people to approach situations that make them inherently uncomfortable. And I haven't done the best the study for this, but there's a great study I wanted to tell you about that came out a couple years ago that really changed how people thought not just about approaching a situation, being, thinking about it as a brave rather than a safe space, thinking about actually approaching discomfort as a way to learn. And I talk a lot about this, about in our classrooms creating brave spaces where we're uncomfortable, where we make mistakes, rather than simply safe spaces where we, we are comfortable but we don't actually learn. And any psychologist will tell you that our, we learn best when we're a state of pushing ourselves right outside our comfort zone. There's a whole term called desirable difficulties that gets at this. So there's a great study that looked at this that actually asked the question, what if we tell people that part of learning is discomfort? rather than the goal is just to learn. If we actually narrate that you get better when you're uncomfortable, would that help people address information that maybe they're not so comfortable about? And the answer is yes. So this team of psychologists at the University of Chicago in the Booth School of Business did a great study last year where they brought Democrats and Republicans to the table and they told some of the Democrats and some of the Republicans that your goal here is just to read as much information as possible to learn. They then told another group, your goal is not just to read as much information as possible as learn, but actually when you feel discomfort and uncomfortable, that's when you learn the most. Then they had the Democrats and the Republicans read two different news sources, Fox News and the New York Times. What they found is for the Democrats and Republicans, they said learning is about being uncomfortable. The Democrats were more likely to read Fox News and the Republicans were more likely to spend more time reading the New York Times. Here's the data. Motivation to read is on the y-axis. The Democrats re were more likely to spend time reading Fox News when they were told that learning was about seeking discomfort. Republicans were more likely to spend time reading the New York Times. Now, we can spend lots of time talking about whether think, what we think about the Times of Fox News, but I think this is a great example of how narrating, talking about the fact that learning takes place when we're uncomfortable can push people to think about information that they don't necessarily want to think about. How does this work in the classroom? 
faculty talking to their students about the value of practice problems, that these are hard to get ready for a test, that it's okay to feel uncomfortable, that if you just look at your book, you might have a feeling that you know it, but if you close it and then test yourself, what does that look like? Actually narrating that we get better, we learn more from being uncomfortable can be helpful. So that's addressing the not getting ready in the right way, but how do we address the negative emotional reactions? My team has been really interested in this as well, and we've actually looked at many different ways in which one could help think about their emotional reactions and actually be able to impact them. I think we often feel like we are really at the prey of our thoughts, our emotions, but there's really amazing lines of psychology research that show that we can get better and practice at thinking about how we feel, which can actually change how we perform. So there's great work, for example, by a psychologist named James Pennybaker that shows that people learning how to journal, for example, over time are less likely to report feelings of depression, are less likely to report feelings of loneliness. People who reappraise their emotional reactions, who think, oh wait, maybe the sweaty palms and beating heart isn't a sign I'm gonna fail. It's a sign that the, the heart is shunting blood to the brain so I can think. That's a sign I'm excited and ready to go. Just reframing and rethinking in that way can change what's happening in our head and how we perform. So we decided to test this. And we tested this in a large high school in the Midwest who had a problem. This high school had been working with one of my former PhD students, and the high school had two schools that went into it. A school that was from middle school, a school that was in a more low income area, and a school that was in a, a higher income area. And what the high school had found over the years is that they were giving every ninth grader a biology test that would dictate at the end of the year, whether they tracked into the college-ready biology or a less, um, more, not as, not college-level biology. And what they were finding is that oftentimes the students who'd come from the low-income background, even when they were well-prepared, were not performing well on this test. And the hypothesis they had is that these students actually feel stressed about who they are, where they come from, and in that moment, in the test, they're not doing as well as they could. So we asked the question, we know that negative emotional reactions can alter how the brain functions, how we perform. Can we help students reappraise, think differently about those reactions in the moment? Can we help them practice to perform better? So we did a study across two years, across this large Midwestern high school with, um, I think our total sample size was um, 1,500 students or maybe closer to 2,000 students. And what we did, the school year began, and this was a really interesting high school because every student who was taking biology took the same exam at the end of the year and many different teachers teaching it. And at the school year began, they came in and we were able to randomly assign students to either before they got ready for their exam at the end of the fall semester and the end of the spring semester, either just get some extra time to study or to actually do an exercise where they learn to reappraise their negative emotions. So they did something where they read a, a, an article about the fact that sometimes we have beating hearts, sweaty palms, this can make us perform poorly, but actually it's really important. And if we think about our emotions as really something that's ready to go, like if we didn't have a beating heart, we'd be dead. They read this and they practiced it, then um, you can actually perform better. So here's what happened across these two years, the school year began. Some of our students did this writing exercise before their exams. They had a fall semester exam. Again, the same students who were assigned to this um, treatment group did the writing exercise before the spring exams. They took a final exam and the school year ended and we gave them an end of year survey. So we randomly assigned people, so some students just got the control condition, business as usual before the exam, they just got ready for it. Other students in this treatment group, we asked them to do this writing exercise, to reappraise how they were thinking. They then got to write about their thoughts and feelings for 10 minutes, to write about their, their negative emotions, and then we had them take the exam. What we found is that for the students who came from the more higher income high school who were sort of stereotyped to be good at what they were doing, there was no impact of doing this sort of exercise on how they performed. But for the students who came from this lower income school system where we knew the stereotype existed in the school about being evaluated based on where you'd come from, doing this writing exercise actually changed the course passing rate in the exam. And here's the data. So on the, the left is um, 
the, percent, the passing rate. And what you can see is that for the business as usual condition, it, these students passed about 60% of the time. This was a hard exam. And for our intervention condition, they passed about 80% of the time. Now, this wasn't a big difference in grades. Passing was like 50 versus 55 failing, but it moved them just enough across the needle doing these exercises to actually impact their performance. And then we also asked them how they felt about their anxiety. And what we showed is that for students in this intervention condition, they actually felt that their anxiety, these feelings were more positive, that it wasn't so bad to have them. Just like maybe learning and doing something is, that is difficult is not so horrible as well. So just to sum up here, we believe we, we understand a little bit more from these studies about how anxiety relates to performance. What you, how you perform is not necessarily a function of just what you know. How you prepare really matters, and how you think about yourself in this situation matters too. And um, we think this is really exciting. We'll say in this high school that after they got this data and we published this paper, they start, stopped doing this exam to track students into lower and higher science classes, which we think is a great success, because it turns out this one exam isn't a great way necessarily to tell how people did. But I think it's also exciting to understand that even if you're anxious about something, it makes you uncomfortable. That's not a sign you're going to fail. Maybe it's exactly the sign you need to dig in to study with other people, to ask for more practice problems, and um, to take it to the next level. So I will leave it there. If you want to read more about some of our work, as you heard, we have, uh, I have a couple of books on the subject, a TED Talk. You can be more than just my mom, who I think watches it every day. Um, <laughs> and um, I'm happy to answer questions. Yes. I'm curious if you've done studies across different age groups and whether there are differences among, say, toddlers uh, and early learners and adults, and then also maybe across the demographics. Yeah, the age, I get to ask the age group question all the time, and I haven't done studies across looking specifically, but I will say that even young kids have anxiety and anxiety about math. So one place that, and again, it's a talk for another time, that we've looked is, is when math anxiety starts. And people often said it started in middle school and the math got hard or high school. And my research team and I have shown that as early as first grade, some students have math anxiety. And actually, you can predict the level of math anxiety based on a pretty interesting factor, not at the beginning of the year, but the, at the end of the year. Does anyone want to guess what it is? Parents, Parents matter. Parents do matter. Something else matters a lot, too. Standardized tests, there's a, it's an open question about whether they lead to math. I mean, you certainly feel uncomfortable when you're doing them, but the teachers, the teachers. So it turns out, as I mentioned, that um, teachers have one of the highest math anxiety level of any college major elementary school teachers, and there's something actually also really interesting and very homogeneous about elementary school teachers in the US. Does anyone know what it is? Yeah, almost 90% are women. And what we found is that at the beginning of the school year, there's no relationship between a teacher's math anxiety and her student's math anxiety. But by the end of the school year, kids in classrooms with teachers who are more anxious are more anxious themselves and more likely to perform poorly. Now, this happens for both boys and girls, but the effect is larger in girls. You see more of an impact. And we've also shown by the end of the school year, girls in that classroom are more likely to endorse the idea that a boy is good at math and a girl is good at reading. It starts really early. Testing, test, okay. Great talk. Um, do you think your studies might carry over to foreign languages? Like, I think your <laughs> word problems are interesting, but that, I assume, would be like a native language or someone fluent in that language. Yes. We always controlled for that, actually. But yeah, I mean, the question is, is there something special about math? Like, I told you I used this as a test case, basically. I think it's a really important issue, especially in Western cultures, about how we're approaching math and how we're doing as a nation. Um, but sure, if you have anxiety about foreign languages, and you could see some of, I'd say, the same things going on. I don't think there's something particular 
particularly significant about the domain being math. But what, you know, we use words or language as a, sort of the, the control because what we're showing is it's not just anxiety in general or not wanting to work hard in general. It's when you're anxious about a particular subject, you can see this impact on the things you're anxious on and not on other things. But yeah. But math, just one more thing, is math is interesting in itself in that we do often talk about being math anxious. It tends to be higher in women and girls than boys. And it's one of the first, and the question is why, right? And it's one of the first places in school where you start getting right and wrong very quickly, like it's right or it's wrong. And going back to our teacher study, we've shown that teachers who are really anxious about math are really dogmatic. There's only one right or way to do the math, even in first grade. And so you're starting already to get information that this is right, this is wrong, this is okay, and this is not. And I think it's less likely to happen in other subjects, but that's just a hypothesis. Yeah. It's a great question and one that I've looked at a lot, right? Does it matter if you're holding a pencil or a hockey stick or a golf club in your hand? And in terms of reappraising your reactions, my guess is the answer, we haven't done these studies in explicit comparisons, but the answer should be no. What happens in these stressful situations is that you worry. You worry about the situation, you worry about the consequences, and what it does is change how you focus on information. It changes what you focus on. Now, it just so happens in a physical task that you know really well, focusing on the wrong information could be paying too close attention to what you're doing. Like, if I ask you to shuffle down the stairs and what's going on with your knee, you're gonna fall on your face, right? Because now you're paying attention to something that you shouldn't be paying attention to. But this idea that our emotions, our physiological reaction can get in the way of how we focus on the right information, I think is a uniform thing. Thank you so much for that talk. Um, I had a question about um, really talking, getting into the fact that you said this is predominantly in the Western cultural aspect of things. And so yeah. what cultures have you found harbor better um, uh, perspectives on studying math and so on and sort of like what the field is learning from those said cultures? It's such an interesting question and first of all, I don't think performing poorly under stress is just a Western phenomenon, but certainly math anxiety tends to be more. And if you look at some Asian cultures, for example, just how they teach math is very different. They embrace wrong answers, they're less dogmatic. There's been really interesting math education studies about math learning in Japan, for example. And the, the idea that as you're not as skilled in something, you're really dogmatic in how you teach it, there's a right and a wrong answer, it doesn't seem to play out as much in countries that tend to do much better in math. And so we all know we're in the middle of another math culture war, and I think these are really interesting sorts of ideas in terms of not just the content, but I would think what's even more important is who we're putting in the classroom. And I think it's really a problem that we have. You know, in the US, elementary school teachers are not paid very well, it's not often the, um, the, the place that you would send your best and brightest science student, although I think that's, not, that's unfortunate. And I also think it's different than it was a couple generations ago, where a couple generations ago, if you were a woman who was successful in math and science, one of the only places you had to go was the elementary school classroom. And so I think it's really great that we now have all these opportunities, but we have to think as a society and really systematically about what it means for who's teaching and training that next generation. All right, well thank you very much and I'm looking forward to seeing the posters. Great. Well, thank you very much. We really appreciate you coming and speaking to us about that subject. So, um, we're gonna move on right now, uh, roll right into the student award ceremony. Um, we're a little early, but I think uh, a lot of you are probably anticipating um, the outcomes of that. So uh, first up is the Sigma Xi uh, competition, the Christopher Reed Senior Thesis Competition, and I'd like to invite up to the stage a professor of chemistry, Dean Wilcox, who is also the president of Dartmouth Sigma Xi chapter. So Dean, would you like to come up?
So the Dartmouth chapter of Sigma Xi, which is the Scientific Research Honor Society, is delighted every year to partner with the WISP program to hold our science competition in conjunction with the Karen Wetterhahn Science Symposium. I'll just spend a minute or two telling you what is Sigma Xi. It's not a fraternity down on Frat Row, but in fact, it was an organization founded at Cornell University in 1886 uh, by the science and engineering students there to recognize, to uh, promote, and to honor scientific research. It has grown to an international organization with over 500 chapters, and um, many Nobel Prize winners are members of the, of the organization. Um, it, um, it publishes American Scientist magazine, and it provides modest funding for research, researchers, uh, and advises the, the federal government in many regards. The organization has even broadened to encompass a broader range of what science involves, including the science education, the philosophy of science, and uh, the history of science. Um, the, um, the, the membership is, is, uh, is, is, is at two different levels. One is at the full membership level, which is for those that are practicing scientists, generally that have the PhD degree. And then there's also at the associate level. And uh, that's particularly going to be important because all the participants in the uh, Chris Reed Science Competition will be nominated by the chapter for associate membership in Sigma Xi. The Dartmouth chapter does two different activities every year. One is an award ceremony where we recognize new members of the organization. And the second is the Chris Reed competition. So this, this competition was started many years ago uh, and is named after the late professor of the biology department, Chris Reed, who was very active in the chapter and is a chance for students completing an honors thesis in science to compete for cash prizes, but really to showcase to a panel of science judges the excellent work that they've done. And uh, this afternoon, 22 seniors participated, and uh, I will speak for the other three judges, uh, Will Levitt in Earth Sciences, uh, Tim Smith in Physics, and Robin Barbato from uh, Krell, that we were again blown away by the research that the seniors are doing. I mean, many of these are master's theses. Um, and, um, and the recognition is that all of them will be nominated for membership, but it is a competition, so in fact, there are some winners that we have to announce. Uh, I'm delighted to announce. Um, so, without further ado, um, there are two third place winners. Uh, the first of these, uh, her research was towards a universal flu vaccine, guiding the immune response with glycans, Maya Madison. Is Maya here? <laughs> uh. So a little ribbon to put on your poster. <laughs> The other third place prize was for discovering and characterization of exoplanetary system TOI-3353, Jack Duranceau. Is Jack here? <laughs> it's pretty amazing when you discover a planet. He discovered two. Second prize in the Chris Reed competition this year uh, for her work, The Influence of pH on Crinarchial Abundance, Origins of an Enigmatic Archaeal Lipid is Amanda Calhoun. And first place this year uh, for her work, Access to Below Ground Networks Modulates Seedling Survival Under Different Forest Management Types, Eva Leg. Where's Eva? She's doing her, defending her thesis. As I thought she was heading back out of the field to do more field work, but all right, congratulations to Eva. We'll put this on her poster, so. 
Anyways, congratulations to all the participants who did amazing work and will receive Sigma Xi membership and to those winners of this year's Chris Reed Science Competition. Great. Uh, next up, I'd love to uh, welcome up to the stage our STEM research librarians. Uh, they have been wonderful in helping us um, uh, reach out to undergraduates and learn how to not only prepare um, your message and your poster for these kind of events, but how to go into a research project in general. And that's just such a critical thing as you're maybe in your first or second year of college. Um, so I'm really grateful to the work they've done um, helping in that regard. Uh, I'd love to welcome up uh, Lily Linden and Gentry Campbell and Matt Vinson. Matt Vinson, nice to, meet you. <laughs> nice to have you here as well. Good evening. Uh, the STEM Librarian Core team is thrilled to present certificates to the winners of the Award for Library Research for the Sciences for 2023, which is sponsored by the Dartmouth Library and by the Friends of Dartmouth Library. Students that entered were asked to write about a little short reflection of what they went through in the process of finding, selecting, and using information in the development of their research, and then what they learned from that iterative process. So we were really, really impressed by all your submissions, thank you. Um, and selecting top reflections, as <laughs> Nandi mentioned, is really hard, but we'll jump right into it. So we'll start with our junior-senior category, um, and I'll just introduce myself as well. I'm Lily Linden, and I support the chemistry and biology departments at Dartmouth. I'm excited to announce the winner for the first category, um, Elisa Fairman. Are you here, Alyssa? I'll just add, Alyssa is a member of the class of 2023, and she's majoring in uh, biology with a minor in anthropology of global health. She wrote about her research in Biology 70, the biologic lessons of the eye, taught by Dr. Michael Ziegens. Hi, I'm Matt Benzing, and I support the uh, computer science and engineering departments. The runner-up for this junior-senior category is Eunice Liu. <laughs> Eunice is a member of the class of 2023 and is majoring in quantitative social science with a computer science minor. She wrote about her work as a research assistant to Dr. Erica Moen. Hello everyone, I'm Gentry Campbell and I also support the Thayer School of Engineering as a librarian. The first place in the sophomore senior category, or the, the first year sophomore category, excuse me, goes to Ash Chinta, the class of 2025, who has yet to declare their major. Unfortunately, Ash is unable to join us today, but they wrote about their independent research with Dr. Katie O'Neill in psychology. I'm also able to support, or to present to the runner-up today in the first year sophomore category, Faith Nii Awalesi, class of 2026, who also has yet to declare her major. Is Faith here? <laughs> Faith wrote about her work as a WISP research assistant in Dr. Kiera Sanchez's psychology lab. Thank you all so much for your time, and to the Dartmouth STEM students who entered their reflections into the competition, and to the faculty who mentored them. We really look forward to your STEM journeys at Dartmouth, and we look forward to supporting you. Back to you, Morgan. Great. So the last category of award that we have tonight is actually from my own program, the Women in Science Project. Um, every year, we're very happy to offer two sophomore scholarships that allow um, current interns to work with their mentors, their WISP mentors, in their sophomore year. Um, and it also comes with a nice little cash prize, um, which is also great. Um, so this year, um, First up, we have the Carol Folt Scholarship Award, which is named after our former interim president, provost, professor of biological sciences, dean of faculty. She did everything and was just an amazing um, campus community member and um, Dartmouth um, uh, 
everything. <laughs> um, and uh, so the, the WISP intern who will be receiving the FOLT award this year is someone whose mentor was really impressed by her self-motivation and autonomy working in the lab, and that is Kyra Schliepak. Kyra, are you here? And Kyra is in the Psychological and Brain Sciences Lab of Viola Stoimer. The second sophomore scholarship is the Barbara E. Kroop Memorial Internship, named after a former biologist um, here at Dartmouth. Um, this one is awarded to somebody whose uh, mentor wrote an absolutely glowing um, recommendation for her um, and was just very impressed by her commitment to the, pl the project that she had laid out, but also to the lab itself. And that person is Annika Nikar. And then we have a couple of surprise awards. Um, because we had such a stellar candidate pool, it was very, very difficult for us to make our decision. Really, it was something um, we had a very hard time with. Um, so we actually have two WISP Research Engagement Awards um, that we'd like to offer up in recognition of two students who really put in the lab hours and showed um, just a lot of fortitude in committing themselves to the lab work to, and to their projects. And so the first one I'd like to invite up is Brenna Slaney, who is in the chemistry lab of Christopher Sanford. Brenna, are you here? <laughs> and the second uh, WISP Research Engagement Award recipient is going to be Madeline Sereski, who I know I saw earlier, and hopefully she's in the room. Hi, Madeline. <laughs> and Madeline is in the... F uh, Astronomy Lab of Professor um, Bershin Mutlu Pakdil. Great. So I want to thank you all again for coming out tonight and for um, uh, listening to um, our new president give her talk and to celebrating our undergraduates who have done so much this year and have really achieved um, so much. We do have a little time before the, uh, the student poster session kicks off at 5.30, so you might see some empty posters. They're probably just out um, finishing their defense of their theses or uh, getting lunch or getting dinner at this point. Um, so if you don't see them immediately, just give them about 20 minutes and they'll be around. But I'd like to thank you all for coming out, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the evening.